Hi, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome wherever you are right now, physically, mentally, spiritually. We are grateful that you have made the commitment to show up and learn more about how congregations and groups can help support new neighbors. My name is Sasha Bodner. I'm new in my role as Director of Organizing and Multi-Faith Initiatives with JCRC Boston, along with my creative, daring, and inspiring multi-faith collaborators, Reverend Laura Everett and Reverend Kelly Fassett, who you'll hear more from in a moment and throughout this conversation. I wanna thank you for your interest and support for our neighbors in need. And a huge thanks, especially to our panelists for sharing their time and expertise today. Before I turn it over to Reverend Laura, uh, Reverend Laura and Reverend Kelly and distinguished panelists, I wanna quickly share a few words about JCRC as well as a roadmap of where we'll go together during this hour. I'm also gonna ask you to please take a moment to complete this very quick survey that should pop up momentarily. For those that may not know, the Jewish Community Relations Council of Boston, JCRC, is a network of organizations working to activate the Jewish community on core value issues in the broader civic space. Among those values, and for the last six years, JCRC has worked closely in partnership with Catholic Charities Boston and Jewish Family Services of Metro West, building a network of hundreds of volunteers and experts from synagogues and churches across the Commonwealth, all in a united effort to resettle refugee populations fleeing dangerous conditions in their home countries. In short, we're here as a partner to you, your congregants, and your communities to give you the resources so that you feel supported in this work and can ultimately say yes to helping our newly arrived neighbors. To guide us first, our friend Casey Dillon will talk to us about this work, her organization Welcome NST, and a national incentive through Welcome Corps to help defray the costs associated with resettling families. Next, Jessica Lasser, congregant at Temple Beth Elohim, will share some of her personal experience and lessons learned working directly with a resettled family. And then Lino Covarrubias, executive director of JFS Metro West, will share his expertise in additional ways that communities can support new neighbors. After that, we'll come back for some Q&A time before closing uh, with a one question survey. And finally, we'll travel onward, hopefully better having spent this time together and more equipped with the knowledge and tools to take action. I'd like to now pass the baton to my partners, Reverend Kelly and Reverend Laura. Thank you so much for helping to make this webinar possible and for all you're doing to care for neighbors, welcome strangers and strengthen our community. Amen. Thank you so much, Sasha. It's great to be out with everyone here this afternoon. Um, my name is Reverend Kelly Fassett. I'm the executive director of Unite Boston, and we're bridging historic divides across Christians to seek the flourishing of the city. One of the things that we do is really help Christians come alongside some of the biggest needs that we see and really making a difference in the city. And we have seen so many new neighbors right at our doorsteps. And we really believe that we have a valuable role to play to show God's love and care to those who are displaced or seeking refuge. And um, with Unite Boston, we have a campaign called the Sanctuary for Strangers. It's a landing page that we're continually updating with resources and action steps that people can take, um, including hosting a Migrant Sunday. So I'll put that in the chat for everyone to look at. And I'm also here as a part of a, a great team of people that we're calling the Interfaith New Neighbor Coalition. Um, so not only our organization, it's been incredible to work with uh, many people, who, some of whom are on the call and many others who are supporting our neighbors in practical ways, like coordinating supply drives, mobilizing volunteers to make a difference, and really, this has been spearheaded and convened by uh, Reverend Laura Everett, who is the executive director of the Massachusetts Council of Churches. And so I want to pass it over to her to share a little bit more about why we are here. Thank you, Reverend Kelly. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Reverend Laura Everett. I serve as the executive director of the Massachusetts Council of Churches. And with Sasha and Reverend Kelly, we are just three of the folks who make up the Massachusetts Interfaith New Neighbors Coalition. With our colleagues at Black Ministerial Alliance of Greater Boston um, and a few other organizations, we've been gathering for the past few months to make sure that there is an interfaith collaboration 
to gather resources, congregations, volunteers, and try to hold a different kind of congregation conversation about how local faith communities can support our new neighbors. We know that there have been lots of conversations and lots of efforts among those who are here who are supporting uh, our new neighbors. And there's a lot that we can't control. There are a lot of things that are beyond our control, but we know there are lots of people of goodwill and lots of ways that we can be of help. And we wanna make that helping easier. And so we've seen congregations step up in some beautiful and profound ways. Many of you are already doing that. And first off, we wanna thank you. Thank you for the ways that you are already doing that. Hopefully today we offer a few more ways. But one of the things um, I wanna be explicit about right now is that there are new regulations that um, the current administration has announced that break my heart, uh, that will go into effect as of August 1. And it would be pastoral misconduct to start this call without naming that there are some new um, restrictions on where people can stay. And this coalition with our partners in the immigration and homelessness organizations will get back to you about the other things we need to do. But those rules and regs that limit how long people can stay in homeless shelters just came out yesterday. And candidly, they're bad. Um, and they're limiting for people who have gone through very, very hard situations. So let your heart break. Um, and let yourself weep. Um, because we know as people of faith, our job is to love our neighbors. That's true across all of our traditions. That said, um, the things that are in our control are how we talk about our neighbors, the language that we use. And you all know that words matter and they can hurt. So one of the things that we are committed to is how we tell our stories. We can talk about our new neighbors we can talk about this being a housing problem, not a people problem, not a migrant problem. We can proclaim that as people of faith, that we do not shut our doors to our new neighbors and that this is not a housing problem, this is a humanitarian crisis. We can say that we serve a God of abundance and that there is zero excuse in this man-made disaster. We have a problem not of immigrants, but of capacity and of will. And so before I start preaching anymore, and before we turn it over to our um, guest speakers, I'm wondering if you all would join with me in a moment of prayer. Let us pray. Almighty one, you have led your people in every generation. Remind us that we were once also strangers in the land of Egypt. Remind us that when you sent us out, you sent us out two by two, so that we might not sojourn alone. Remind us again that our home is ultimately with you. Holy One, in the time ahead, expand our hearts and expand our imaginations so that we might see our neighbors as ourselves. We know you by many names and we trust that you move among us. Let the people say, Amen. Dear ones, I am so pleased to introduce you to my colleague, Casey Dillon, who's here as the Director of Outreach for Welcome NST. Casey, we're so pleased to have you. And to begin with, what we're wondering is, can you help explain to us three things? What is Welcome NST? What is the Welcome Corps and how are they different? And then why right now is it important for us to get involved? Yes, yeah. Well, thank you all so much for um, having me here and allowing me to speak to this incredible group of people who obviously we all uh, were here because we share a similar heart um, for, like Reverend Laura said, welcoming and loving the stranger. And um, that is really the backbone um, and the purpose um, of how Welcome NST works and how it was founded. So Welcome NST is a 501c3 
three nonprofit organization that started in, um, well, close to all of us in Bolton, Massachusetts. Um, it was uh, started approximately just almost three years ago, just under three years ago in response to the Afghan evacuee crisis. Um, and it was started as a grassroots effort to welcome through sponsor circles, Afghan families. And from that, it has grown to what it is now today. So we are an organization that works across all 50 states. We are private, we are, we are not government funded, but we work quite closely with the USCIS and with some of the other larger um, refugee resettlement organizations. Uh, and we work to, um, to resettle uh, families from um, countries that are in need, families seeking res refuge um, through multiple private sponsorship pathways. That's sort of the bread and butter of what we do. We are, um, we are an organization that walks alongside neighborhood support teams. That's the NST. Work alongside. We walk alongside neighborhood support teams and mentor you through the process of welcoming a family to the United States to a neighborhood. Um, the Welcome Corps is um, a program that was. Um, put in place in January of 2023 by the Biden administration and through the US um, CIS. The US CIS manages that program. The Welcome Corps is a private sponsorship, private resettlement pathway. Um, it is an incredible opportunity for everyday um, individuals like each of us here on this call to say yes to, um, to supporting and sponsoring a refugee family with a team of people. Uh, they have streamlined the process so that each individual that decides to do this um, partners with a private sponsor organization like Welcome NST. We are one of about 12 in the country. And, um, and we partner together with you, our organization, Welcome NST, and Welcome Corps to walk through the process of applying, getting matched with a refugee family, uh, welcoming that family into your community and then resettling them. The third question that Reverend Laura asked was um, specifically about why now? Um, why is it important for congregations to get involved now? The answer to that question is that uh, I think it's twofold. One, um, none of us know what the future holds. I mean, that's true always, but in November, we're not sure what will happen, right? And we don't know what our ability will be as private citizens to sponsor refugees. Uh, but two, we have an opportunity to um, to access grant funding uh, right now, which has never happened before. Um, for the month of July, um, ending on July 31st, every individual team of um, a neighborhood support team, a community team, whether it be a congregation or multiple congregations, interfaith groups working together, um, every group that says, yes, we'd like to do this and begins a Welcome Corps application will be given $2,425 per individual refugee that you will sponsor. So a family of four, about $10,000. And that is set, that is meant to offset the cost um, that, that refugee resettlement through private sponsorship um, can entail for, for individual families. So the opportunity is um, incredible to be given that kind of funding and um, it is limited. Thanks, Casey. Um, sure. I'm wondering if you can, that's just a really helpful overview. And I'm wondering if you can talk us through what's actually required when we talk about signing up as a welcome team, what does yeah. that mean? So a welcome team is um, is made up of anywhere from, we say starting five to 10 individuals. Uh, usually two of those individuals say, we are going to co-lead this together, this team. That team of individuals can be literally neighbors, they can be coworkers, they can be congregations, or like I said, it can be a, a, a mix of a, a bunch of different community organizations. That's the beauty of private sponsorship is it's not limited to any one area, but it is a group of people that share a heart for sponsoring a family. And what it looks like is a team of individuals in the United States being matched with one family seeking refuge. And so it's a one-to-one -one match process. Um, so what, what is a, a neighborhood support team? It is a group of five to 10 people that step, step up and say, yes, we would like to sponsor a family and welcome them into our community. Uh, 
so say say my local church um or or one of the churches in mass council's network um first congregational church of where burham wilshire shire town um in massachusetts we have a few of those um <laughs> uh, puts together a team of five and um says yes welcome nst we would like to um meet this deadline because that extra funding um would help what kind of support does welcome nst offer and for how long that's a great question so the for how long i can answer first very simple for as long as needed. So we don't have a time limit to how long we offer our services for to you. Um, we also don't charge. There's no fees involved. There's no hidden fees. There's It's it's a service where, again, we are privately funded and our hearts are all um, like yours that we wanna do this for the good of those in need. Um, how does a, a local congregation know if they have the capacity to take this on and what does that look like, um, in particular signing up before that July 31st deadline? Um, it really just takes a few people. It takes maybe one or two people that say, we can do this. This is important. We Our community has the, the human and the financial resources to make this work, and this would matter um, in our community. Um, and they get in contact with um, me. I am like the director, like, I, like you said, the director of local outreach. So via email, and I can put my email in the chat. And it's an email that just says, um, hey, we're interested. Um, and then we have a conversation. And if that conversation leads to, yep, we've got these two people or three people or four that want to do this, um, we sign up your team and we um, get you logged into the Welcome Core platform. And you are then, uh, then the, you then are in the system, so to speak, and you your team will have access to the sponsor fund money. And and what does that support from Welcome MNST? Yes. Look like? Yes. Yes. So um, as many of you probably are aware, um, resettling a family from a different country is quite um, it's it's involved, and it takes a lot of. Um, effort and a lot of love and a lot of patience and a lot of people, uh, which is the beauty of private sponsorship really and why it's been so successful in these last few years that it's been available to us. So what we offer um, each team is one, a mentor. So we assign every team a mentor from Welcome NST. That mentor has, has resettled on their own personally a number of teams. All of our mentors have. We walk you through that process. We walk you through applying. We walk you through the matching um, that we do through the USCIS and your refugee family that would be coming to you. Um, from pre-arrival to arrival to post-arrival, we have steps and team roles and responsibilities and checklists that we supply to you. We have assets that we have created that help you to spread this kind of information in terms of what you're doing, whether it be social media or within your neighborhoods and communities, your congregations. Um, so we have we have the ability to walk you through the process. And so you don't feel like you're welcoming a family into your community and saying, I have like, I don't even know what to do. I have no idea what comes next. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. We do. And so we we help through the entire process with no with no end point. That's fantastic. Uh, Casey, thank you so much. It's a lot of support, You're welcome. It's a lot of information. And if somebody wanted to learn more about, you know, taking that next step, where's the best place to do that? So I would say it's twofold. One, like I said, I, I can put my uh, email directly into the chat, but also um, you can go and I'll put this in the chat as well. You can go to the Welcome NST website. Um, and there is a place where you can fill out an interest form and that comes directly to me and I can contact you. Um, so those two places are the first um, the first steps to getting involved and getting this process going. Thank you, Casey. And we'll share that. We'll share that email address and, and website in the, in, in the chat for the participants here. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jessica. Hi, thanks so much for joining us. I want to pivot now, uh, Jessica, just briefly to introduce Jessica is a, a community builder, an attorney, a mom. Uh, and uh, has actually done this work and is here to tell us a little bit about what that looks like from the perspective of one of the families who's spent time welcoming and helping to resettle uh, a, a new family. Again, Jessica, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a real honor. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about 
my experience in helping working with refugee resettlement, which I've been doing purely as a volunteer for the past 10 years, and then how I got involved in Welcome Corps, still purely as a volunteer, um, in the hopes that it will entice other people to sign up and to see that it's not too heavy of a lift and it's a really wonderful experience. Um, so just as a background, um, I, I'm sure many of you remember this, but on September 2nd, 2015, the New York Times published the photo of the two-year-old um, Alan Curdy's lifeless body, Faith down on the beach after he had drowned off the shore of Turkey um, while his family was attempting to flee war toward Syria. And that day the picture was published. I was seven months pregnant with my, with my third child. And I looked at the photo, feeling the little child in, inside of me and just my heart was breaking. Um, so I turned to the place I naturally go when I feel like I needed to show up somewhere as my heart breaks. And that was Temple Beth Elohim or TBE for short, which is my synagogue in Wellesley. Um, and I didn't know at the time, but I should have expected that other congregants were eight steps ahead of me and were already thinking more ambitiously than my wildest imagination. So um, with that congregation in just over a year, our TBE Refugee Resettlement Committee raised tens of thousands of dollars and comprised a volunteer committee of over 90 people. Um, and we all together shared an unfailing commitment to show that the Jewish community who had been turned away by so many countries during World War II and in much of earlier history must show up for Jews. I mean, not for, I'm sorry, must show up for Jews, but also for all displaced people, including these Syrian refugees. Um, so our first family arrived soon after in January, 2017, right before the Muslim ban was initiated by the previous administration. And the busy work of welcoming a refugee family takes place the first few months, like ushering the family to the doctor's visits, getting them to the public benefit offices, helping them find jobs, like waiting rooms and traffic jams. These ended up becoming like wonderful times to teach English, to introduce American music on the radio and to show off the city of Boston. Um, and for me with this family, our true bonding came through our children. The family had four, has four gorgeous, children who are all roughly the same age as mine. Um, I introduced our children to each other for the first time after a major January snowstorm. And it was the Syrian family's first experience with snow. So we drove to the top of Callahan State Park. We took out the sleds and we stood at the top of the hill. And though they still weren't speaking English and we certainly weren't speaking Arabic, it was just hilarious. And everyone shared the sled and all of everybody was laughing the whole time and it was amazing. And at one point the father, he carried my daughter up a hill while my son and his boys were flying down the hill. And we all went back afterwards, laughing, laughing, laughing to their house for tea and for the mom who's the most incredible cook still for her hand, um, her homemade cooking and just all these hand motions and conversations via Google Translate. So in the coming months, um, all the volunteers and the family explored Boston together. We called the father the human GPS because he always knew where he was. And we had the family for new adventures like a night at the Nutcracker, uh, the aquarium, um, Walden Pond, Drumlin Farm. The adventures together just made me proud of Boston, proud of the people in each location who welcomed the family with kind words and generosity, and most incredibly proud of my congregation for bringing an immigrant family in the right way, helping them grow and thrive into self-sustaining U.S. citizens. So over the years, we grew to care for each other's children like our own. I remember one day the mom expressed to me concern about my daughter's delayed ability to walk and she gave her the spice zatar, which she said would help her with her development. And to this day, my daughter, who's an excellent walker, her favorite food is pizza, is pita, labna, and zatar. Um, and from the parents of the Syrian family, I learned how to have a little more patience with my children. I learned the Arabic words for the two most important phrases in, in child rearing, shwe shwe, careful, careful, and yala, hurry up. And over the course of the past eight years, the Syrian family has become family to us. Like family, they enrich my daily life even we, when we aren't in constant contact. And like family, I find it hard to manage when they are in pain. They've been in so much pain worrying for the health and safety of their family still in the Middle East. They're here, they own a home, they're American citizens, they've had another child, their kids are thriving in school and in the sports. But my, like my mom says, you're only as happy as your least happy child. And this family is only happy as they can be knowing their family is still in danger in Turkey, Lebanon, and Syria. So 
because my husband and my kids and I committed to this work to help combat the growing anti-immigrant fervor in the country and to help innocent people who found themselves in untenable circumstances, we know that we have been the ones who have been changed exponentially by this experience. We've been able to learn alongside our children the value of meeting people different from ourselves, from asking questions, questioning the assumptions of religious disagreement, and welcoming the stranger. And thanks to this new Welcome Corps initiative, we don't have to stop here. We've joined this family to sponsor their brother, wife, and four children who are refugees in Jordan, living with there without permission to work or receive health care. They live in fear they'll be sent back to Syria, where the brother could be jailed for escaping the propulsory army service. And in our opinion, they can't get here soon enough. We want to assist them. We want to help them get jobs. We want to drink tea, tell them they are safe, they're welcome, and this community will always show up for them. Amazing. Thank you, Jessica, for sharing that. Um, really appreciate that story. It speaks to so many different wonderful opportunities to connect and help. Uh, I understand from the limited perspective that I have that your story is is one and another family story might look different. And I know that you're you're doing a beautiful job sharing the highlights. And I'm wondering if you can humbly share some of the challenges that might exist that volunteers might face as well as these beautiful moments. Yeah, definitely. So we have, since the Syrian family has come, we've helped um, resettle families from Afghanistan, the Ukraine, Venezuela, specifically my family has. And each of them has come with their own challenges. Um, so the, with the specifically with our Venezuelan family who just recently came, with the recent influx of undocumented migra migrants, housing, jobs, and mental health professionals are hard to come by and um, and are really necessary. The social security offices we've noticed are more cramped. Um, we we have connections that we've just made because of, you know, by picking up the phone at grocery stores and warehouses and cleaning companies that we were trying to get jobs with. And it's just been harder. Um, in addition, many of the families come, obviously, without driver's license or valid driver's license. Um, in Massachusetts, in particular, it's difficult to get around with without a car. Many jobs require a driver's license. Um, and it, sorry, dogs are going to bark. Um, so I always tell myself that like, as we get frustrated that like, this is hard for me to do, but I, with English as my first language, it's hard for me to do. And I am a lawyer and it's hard for me to do. So anything I can do to help these families with like my background, my language, my own personal chutzpah, my connections, it's just anything I can do is helpful. And though it has been difficult, like there are moments I have never once felt like I couldn't help or that what I was doing wasn't making a difference in the family's life. Thank you, Jessica. And just lastly, you know, you have dogs in the background, kids. Right. What would you say to other, you know, other other families that are contemplating this work? I would say that when I started this, I was like, I have two dogs and three kids. What am I thinking? And they were little and I just didn't know that I could do this. And it's like, the kids, they love it. They hop in the car, they, you know, get in their seatbelts and they love being part of this program. They love getting to know the families. In fact, the families love my dogs. I mean, they just, we become so close with each other that I'd actually feel like it's the perfect volunteer opportunity for people with young kids. Sorry, I knew that was going to happen. Um, so it's just, it's, it's having young children, I think it's often hard to find a good volunteer opportunity to do as your whole family. And this really, really, really worked for us. The kids, we would have them all, attack, you know, one of the things that the families have to learn when they come is like car safety. So I was able to show them car seats and we'd understand how to put the car seats in and my kids would get in and do their thing and then their kids would get in and do their thing. And then we would have snacks in the back seat for everybody. It's just a matter of being a parent makes it easy to help you bond with other parents and to help teach the ways that that their new home, you know, the, the rules of their new home and how things work. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jessica. Really yeah. appreciate you sharing that that story, the perspective. Uh, I want to bring in our friend Lino Covarrubias. 
from JFS Metro West. Lino, uh, we've heard about Welcome Corps. We've heard about working with the re refugee families uh, directly. Can you talk to us a little bit about JFS Metro West? And in addition to Welcome Corps, what are a couple opportunities that are also available for folks who might want to get involved in supporting their new neighbors? Thank you, Sasha. Happy to. First of all, thank you for putting this together. Um, and I, I must say that Casey, you know, really made it seem like she she the Welcome Corps is not a big effort. Where uh, I'll describe why their effort is so big. We're Jeff Fast, Metro West, Adam Framingham. We're one of eight resettlement agencies in Massachusetts. So the resettlement agencies, we we get funded uh, from the State Department through an affiliate. For us, it's highest. Um, and others get, you know, Catholic charities, they go through through their affiliate. And we work under really very fixed rules, right? We get funding, very fixed rules. We can't deviate from those rules. And and some of the, the visionaries, a welcome course, is like, well, all the resettlement agencies throughout the country, they have to work these rules. We cannot increase volume through them. It's just not possible because the State Department right, has to be funded, and that's always really a, a challenge to the federal government. And Welcome Corps is really a mission to be able to bring more people uh, from these war-torn areas to our country. So uh, big kudos, because Welcome Corps, it's not like they're professional resettlement agencies. They're not. They're basically volunteers that have a lot of heart and really some really great, great people that say, we can do it. And certainly resettlement agencies you know, we're there to help them out, consult in, in different areas, particularly with, with social workers. Uh, but it's a big effort for Welcome Corps. This is this is not their core competency, and they really jumped in. Uh, so, Casey, I just wanted to say thank you for what you're doing in the area because uh, you are saving lives throughout the world, as we are all are when we bring people to 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 our area. Uh, and uh, for Jessica, I have to say. You know, what your family has done is, is really is something we want to model throughout our community. And particularly when we model uh, different faith groups coming together, our sweet spot has been uh, our faith organizations really stepping up and saying, yes, we want to help uh, those in need. And, and for us in the Jewish community, welcoming the stranger, it was mentioned uh, earlier, is really important. Because, uh, you know, our people started uh, as strangers in a strange land. And we have all been strangers in a strange land. And we all know how that feels. And that's why it's in our Torah, it's mentioned 18 times. It's mentioned more times than any other area of concern because it's so important. So for us, this kind of really centers us. We've been, uh, you know, doing this work for 45 years, since 1979, what really propelled us as a as an organization, was resettling uh, Jewish families from the for former Soviet Union. Uh, they came, you know, maybe of you know know them, you know their families. And that's really the work we started back in, in the 80s, and it's been in our DNA ever since. So it's a really, really important part of what we do. Uh, we do other things, uh, but for us, this is a really special work that we do, really sacred work. Um, I would say that uh, one of the things that uh, really has been a focus for us, as I touched on, is really engaging community in this work. As Welcome Corps has learned, we can't do this alone as, as professionals. We need volunteers. And what uh, has been really, really uh, important for us and successful is engaging volunteers. Temple Bethlehem was one of our first partners when we were doing the Syrian humanitarian project back in 2016. And we saw the power of really engaging faith organizations uh, to take care of people. I mean, there's nothing more engaging than, you know, getting volunteers excited, having a few of, of the coordinators meet the family at the airport. When, imagine, families have been traveling for 20 hours to get to Logan and and we're there with signs in Arabic and, you know, in whatever language of, of the new uh, arrival family and really welcome them and then taking them if all things work work perfectly, we already have access, uh, you know, apartments. We have a cultural appropriate meal waiting for them. That's like a, a, a perfect setup. And and the thing it was it was mentioned today uh, uh, in this session that one of the biggest challenges is housing. And uh, you know, 
one of the things that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll post our link after this, but, you know, it's, it's getting really hard to welcome the stranger in our area. And by the way, we need immigrants in our community uh, for workforce development. We absolutely need them. So, and the government does their best, but government is very slow. You know, government is not set up to move fast, rapidly. We can, everybody here, faith organizations, Welcome Corps, JFS and other uh, nonprofits that do this work, we, we move fast. We can actually make this happen, but without volunteers, that doesn't work. Without community connections, with volunteers, like J Jessica mentioned, what, what the volunteers bring is their social connections to different things, right? They may know somebody who has an apartment. They know somebody who's hiring. There's that, that social capital for new arrivals is extremely important. Uh, so um, all of us that are doing this work uh, really need the community's help. And the community needs uh, immigrants uh, to you know, take care of our aging population, to you know, hospitality, hospitals, we have to figure this out because uh, I can tell you the government is not moving fast enough. Thanks so much, Lino. And uh, I think for for people who are on this call or or watching later on, thinking to themselves, I would I would really like to get involved, and I'm not sure how to take that first step. Can you talk to us a little bit about the resources and the onboarding and the guidance that uh, that the JFS helps so that volunteers like you're talking about who are so needed, who have like a real beautiful desire to lend a helping hand are more prepared to do this work in a meaningful and impactful way. Right, yeah, thank you, Sacha. Yeah, you know, there's different levels of, uh, of how organizations get involved. Some of our, our position where they can definitely provide volunteers and, and vol volunteer leadership. Other organizations are position where they can do volunteers and also raise money uh, to help subsidize the family. Uh, like I mentioned, the, the cost of, uh, of uh, rents is really high currently in Massachusetts. So. Being able to figure out a, a subsidy model for them is really important. Well, we get them up to speed uh, so they can, you know, normally our, our model has always been after one year of our involvement with them is that they're stable and able, and able to uh, exist on, on the current the local economy. Uh, so it's volunteers. It is uh, raising funds within the, the community to be able to do that. Uh, connections to jobs. Uh, leads for housing, all those things that really make our work successful. Thank you again, Lino. And if people want to take that next step, get involved with JFS Metro West, can you share with us uh, an email address or a best way to go ahead and do that? And then I'm going to bounce the question back to you, Lino, but it's open to all of our panelists right now. What we're going to do is take just a few minutes of being able to talk to each other, respond to something that you heard somebody say. Um, I'm going to open it up with the question of what guidance, uh, any other best practices or lessons learned uh, would you share with participants from having gone through this work and supporting our newly arrived neighbors? Lena, why don't you start? Yeah, I think Jessica nailed it. It's uh, most of the organizations involved get more out of it than the families. You know, the, the our, our, all goal, our goal is really to make sure that the families thrive. I like how you said that, Jessica, that the families are thriving. Our, our current immigration program in the United States, and I, I will not call it immigration policy, it is set up to set, set uh, immigrants in a, in a cycle of poverty. So if we involve our community, we can ensure that we break that cycle of poverty and make sure that they're set up to thrive. I will, this is an example I use all the time. We, you know, this is not the same family Jessica was talking about, but we, another Syrian family that we brought in you know, the husband was a goat farmer in Syria, spoke zero English, was illiterate in Arabic. So that makes it even more difficult to learn a new language, had never driven in his life, right? Now he's a manager at a Whole Foods, a produce manager at Whole Foods. His English is pretty good. And I asked him, how did you learn English? He goes, hey boss, on TV, of course. And his family is stable. It's stable, right? We brought somebody... It, it almost in my mind, it was impossible to make them, you know, stable in this economy. And we made it happen because we had volunteers that were constantly teaching them English. Aside from the standard ESL, like zooming in, just doing second grader books, you know, elephants, apple, you know, just standard stuff. And and it worked. And so it's it's really engaging for volunteers. They get a lot of it, but it's hard work. I think Jessica also, and I'm glad you you mentioned. 
uh, you know, what, what's the difficulties? They become your family. Just like imagine uh, we we found a new a new family member from somewhere somewhere from other part of the world. We feel responsible. So it is it is one of those things that really enhances your life, but also you feel responsible because we kind of are. So, Sasha, can I just piggyback off of that real quickly? Um, the other thing that I think is important to say is, as many of us on this call probably are part of some sort of faith congregation. Um, I sort of wear two hats. I work for Welcome NST, but my um, my church community and our community has welcomed seven families to New Hampshire in the last two and a half years ourselves. Um, and we are not a diverse area. Um, I don't know if any of you know New Hampshire. It's not particularly diverse. Um, but what we what we found within our church congregation and even those in the community not involved in a faith community is it really pulls people um I hate off the bench, so to speak. Um, the people that aren't particularly involved in something else that are um, are are maybe sort of on the sidelines in your community or sidelines of your congregation. Um, we have seen it time and again, and even just throughout Welcome NST and the mentorship there. Um, this is something that engages people. Private sponsorship in, of, of families engages people in a way that I had never dreamed. Um, and, and it's so much bigger than us. And um, it is so beautiful. I can't say enough, Jessica, I have three kids as well. And what it does for families um, is incredible. Uh, and so I, I just can't, it just, it, the engage it, the way that it engages whole communities and congregations um, to rally around something so good and so meaningful is just, it, it's, I, I think you can't compare it to anything else. Thank you, Casey. Uh, we'll use this time to ask each other a few questions and then we'll open it up for uh, Q&A. If anybody wants to respond or ask anything else of something that you heard, go for it. I, I, I definitely have a, a question for Casey. Uh, definitely, you know, what, what are your needs currently? I mean, you, you've been doing a great job. A lot of folks have been coming in. Well, you know, if you think about your higher high needs, what, what are those, what do those look like? Um, right now we need, we, thanks for asking that. We need, um, we need new teams. We need new neighborhood support teams that say yes to this, to take advantage of that sponsor fund. Um, well, primarily to welcome more refugees, but because we have this available funding, um, and because we would like to continue to offer funds, we sort of have a month to prove that this actually works, that providing funding increases private sponsorship engagement. And so, we are working really hard to get new teams to step up and say yes to doing this. Um, that that's the that's the, honestly that's the main need I would say right now. Just just people people to say yes. We'll form a team. I think there's often a question about um, you know cost to this, which I know the the money coming in is about ten thousand dollars typically, right, to help a family come. Um, is what's Correct me if I'm wrong. What's required from the government? They require you to prove that you have, am I right, twenty four hundred dollars per person. That that's right? what they, yeah, that's what they recommend. Um, it requires exactly, <clears throat> and, and so that's so, why that's how much they're giving in the grant. And I think that that, as we filled out the forms for a couple of families, I think that feels daunting. So that is such a good push. To then know that if you have that money, what you need, uh, what else you need is a heart and gumption to, to make things work. Oh, I love the way you just said that, Jessica. <laughs> That's exactly what you need. A heart and gumption. The rest comes, it falls into place, but you're right. Uh, that's, I love how you said that. Um, um, Friends, we want to point out that there is a Q&A button um, for those who are attending so that you can um, ask your questions um, in that chat function, in the um, Q&A function for the panelists. And um, as we begin to invite you to do that, um, I would love to hear from Jessica and Casey. Um, and I'll share a little of a story on this. Um, 
we had uh, an apartment on my block here in Boston where a new um, migrant family moved in and um, really turned to my family for a lot of support. And it was a huge learning experience for me that um, we really should have had a team around them that one family and one family was not enough support for a family that com was coming in with a ton of trauma. Um, and so I'm curious for you all, what, what was, what made this work by working as a team? Um, tell me about that team experience for you all. Um, yeah, I mean, the team experience, I think, is huge. Um, I think that if you, that, and that's why the w Welcome Corps does require that when you submit the final application, you list five team members. Um, again, you don't have to start there. You can start with one or two, but they, they recommend five. And we generally say our experience has shown us that five or 10 is more ideal um, because it would be, uh, the, these families do, and all of them are different. We're all individuals, right? Some are, are independent, um, and don't have a lot of trauma and, and do well within a few months and others. Um, it's a lot of, a lot of phone calls and texting and it's time spent. Um, and I think tapping in the beauty of private sponsorship is the team dynamic because you're tapping into the, the expertise and the resources, I don't just mean financial of your community. That's how you find housing. It's how you find jobs. It's how you get kids registered for school. Um, it's how you get benefits set up and you get cars donated. So that's the the beauty of it for me is the the community engagement is what makes it successful. We at, at Temple Beth Elohim, we've all we always work with a team for each family. So we started out with, I think the Syrian families, we had seven people on a core team, and then we had a assistant team who did driving when the core team couldn't do it. And then we had this like research team that we would send emails out to and they would find, you know, 12 summer programs that the kids could go to. Like so that was a huge team. But as we've continued on right now with our Venezuelan family, we have, I think, five people on a team and it's still the same setup. We have weekly meetings on Zoom where we meet with each other. We talk about the families. We have a Google Doc that we go through talking about healthcare, school, employment, ESL, um, anything else the family needs, household goods, and just getting them into the community. And that has been incredible because especially also, you know, we have somebody takes care of, for instance, I'm usually medical. So if I'm on medical, I take care of that. But if I am overwhelmed or I'm having a hard time with the doctor or something, everybody else on the team can see that and says, I know this person, I'll call this person. You know, it's, it really helps doing it. One family would be so overwhelming. It's overwhelming enough to take care of our own families. So it, the, the team is vital and a team that you trust. Yeah. That team mentality is that's, that's a beautiful model and it's crucial. Um, as we continue to talk through this, I want to bring it to a few questions that we got in the pre-survey that asked a few questions about something you'd like to know about resettlement work. In the meantime, excuse me, in the meantime, you're welcome to use the Q&A button and continue to put things there. I'm gonna apologize in advance. I don't know that we're gonna to get to all of these in real time right now, but we'll try and share answers to this when we post this video later on, okay? Um, so this is a, I think this is a question that, that, that speaks to a lot of, um, uh, struggles that, that that people are having and in, in getting involved in this work. Uh, this person wants to know how to talk to residents um, about how resettlement is vital in loving our neighbors. This person says that they live in an area that is very against affordable housing slash changes in demographics and would love to know how to engage in these conversations without alienating folks on both sides of the issues. Uh, any, any Any advice there? I I am um, I guess I I could give one very quick thirty second example um, more so than the 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 conversation it's the action that I think is um, is what transforms lives so when I had um, we had a gentleman who was a part of our team because of his wife and he was not particularly fond of of the refugee resettlement process. 
Um, but he taught um, uh, Nazir um, from Afghanistan. He did some driving with him. Um, they became fast friends through those car rides together. Um, a man who, you know, would tend to vote against all things politically that involve refugee resettlement and immigration um, became befriended. Uh, they befriended each other and became fast friends. And when Greg had surgery, Mohammed Nazir was the first one to bring him flowers at the hospital. So I think what changed in our community is um, is um, meeting people, meeting other people from countries um, that are not the United States um, and seeing that this work, uh, we're all people, we are all humans. And um, this is important. I, I don't know that I could speak to the, the language as much as just the, the actual hands-on experience. Thanks, Casey. Um, I'm going to... Uh... So, um, Sasha, let me um, yeah, jump ahead. in with this question from um, Reverend Meg Nelson. And Casey, I want to make sure I've got this right. Um, this is about the shelter situation in Massachusetts as well. Um, um, the sponsorship opportunities through Welcome Corps, um, those families are assigned through the federal government, correct? Correct. The families that already are living in this country um, do not, if a team were to form um, to support a family already in this country, um, they that team unfortunately would not qualify for the sponsor fund. Um, they can still form a team and we will still work with them directly. Three of the families that we have from Haiti are from the IFSI organization in Boston. So that's how we met them. Um, but they wouldn't qualify for funding. Got it. Thank you. That That's helpful. Um, and to follow up on that question, um, Reverend Nelson, the, um, there are other ways to come around families in the shelter situations. We are going to need to get back to you about what those ways look like given the state of flux with the emergency shelter situations. Um, we have been in touch with a number of the churches that are around the EA sites. Um, uh, the, sorry, excuse me, the congregations. We're trying to use the language of congregations because there are multiple houses of worship. Um, and the welcome sites, which are um, Quincy and Brighton. Um, there's a lot going on. Um, I ask that folks please pray um, because this is looking not good and there continue to be people arriving and just shutting our doors is not a humanitarian response. And, uh, yeah, Rebbe, you know. Rebbe, if I could add uh, what we're doing, we want to make sure that municipalities know that because they have not been informed by the governor's office, you know, they've seen this decision. They think like the nonprofits and the face organizations are going to step up and yeah, no problem. We have basements for you to sleep in. Uh, we really need to push municipalities to have a response plan in place. Uh, and most of the homeless are going to be in the greater Boston area. So I think now is the time to really, you know, we've been pushing, uh, you know, our municipalities and, and town managers and the mayors out here in Metro West start thinking about this. Um, you know, where are we going to house people? Can we, you know, right now, actually, during the summer, it would be easy because we have the gyms. We can actually access these gyms and set them up for a response. Uh, so, yeah, and we're really concerned about this, too. I think uh, for all those who are participating tonight, it's, your, you know, Ask your your local uh, you know town manager. Ask your your town meeting leader. Hey, have you thought about all these all these families? There will be moms and dads, some single moms. A lot of the Haitian asylum uh, petitioners are single moms with kids, and this rule they're going to be on the street. So we got to be ready to be able to figure this out. And again, just a a point of information for everyone that. Um, so th so that we're clear on our facts um, when people are just talking about migrants, about 50% of the unhoused population in Massachusetts is from Massachusetts originally. Again, and 
and we want to be sure that we're talking about this as a housing problem because we are decades, decades, decades of deferred maintenance of failing to build adequate and affordable housing, right? We don't have a problem about people. We have a problem about housing. We can house enough people in the Commonwealth. Shutting our doors is not an option, right? We're not going to shut our hearts to moms and children sleeping in subway terminals. This is not acceptable behavior for one of the wealthiest nations on the planet. It doesn't work like this. We're not going to do it. And so what are our other options And just punting it to congregations and saying, y'all deal with it is not going to work. So government is what we do as the common good. How are we going to do this together? So us solving it is not the only option either, right? So we're going to, that's why we push it back and say, yeah, people of good faith will do things. I'm sorry, I'm starting to preach, right? So, <laughs> so that's why we're going to, the interfaith group is going to get back together. And then when we go and protest, we need you all to show up, all right? We're going to pray. We're going to strategize. We're going to protest. We're going to gather our stuff. We're going to open our homes. And just um, to bring it back to Welcome Corps yeah. for one second, yeah. because what Welcome Corps does is it brings the people that you can bring over are people who have been designated as refugees abroad. So the government has already designated these people as refugees, but they're from often from the same countries that we're seeing undocumented people come over the borders. And I just wanted to reiterate that it's not the people who we help with Welcome Corps are able to then help other people who speak their language who have come over undocumented. So for instance, the Venezuelan family that we're working with right now, I just picked her up to the mom up to go to a food pantry and in the back of my car popped three other mothers. And I was like, who, what's going on? And she's like, they all need the food pantry. So we were able to all go together to the food pantry. And now those mothers know how to do that and how to take the bus to get there. And so we are bringing people over through this one means, but these people, we were able to find a landscaping company that this family didn't want to work for, but they were able to say, I have a friend who wants to work for the landscaping company. So it's it's help us helping through this mean also means that we're helping through other undocumented means. Amazing. Thank you, Jessica. Um, uh, <laughs> I love how you, you're saying, but I don't, I don't mean to preach. Uh, thank you. Uh, you bring a, you, you bring a reverend to a meeting. You got to expect that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, your time, your wisdom, your heart. Uh, I, I want to turn it back to you, Reverend Laura, to, to just share the next practical steps if people are sort of figuring out, um, A, do I want to do this? And how do I do this? What can, what can they do here? So friends, we're hopeful that um, if your heart and your um, uh, mind and your imagination about what's possible um, is being moved, um, that you start by having a conversation um, uh, with someone else in your congregation. Um, maybe that's your faith leader. Maybe that's a neighbor. Um, what is important in this is not that you have everything figured out, but um, that you start to dream about if there are two or three um, who might be willing to put in an application. That doesn't necessarily commit you, it just begins the process. And as Casey said earlier, um, part of this is proof of concept, um, that there are funds available um, and uh, running a small religious nonprofit. Um, we are uh, also trying to prove that um, there are people of goodwill um, and of good faith who want to um, uh, support and use our social capital connections, resources, um, and relationships to help those um, uh, build a new life in this country. Um, Casey, do I have that right that um, the applications need to be in by July 31? Just started. Just, just started. started. And it in the application okay. does take a little bit of time, but just 
started and you just have to be partnered with a private sponsor organization. Again, Welcome NST is one of several, but like Welcome NST to link, like you have to, the Welcome Core application requires that you're partnered with the PSO and, but just started. That's it. Great. And so we're putting um, your email address uh, in um, uh, and uh, if someone else would add the um, website, we will also. Um... It's in there. Okay. Yeah, great. it's in there. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, and then uh, I want to make sure, is there anything else that needs to be said that hasn't been said before I uh, toss it back to Sasha for a closing prayer? You know, you had your hand up and um, and then I just wanted to bring it back to, I think what sometimes we have seen is that you'll have one congregation that has one or two people that might be interested, but they're having trouble getting five people together. And I think as we've come together, you know, uh, connecting, you, you know, across faiths, working through divides here, we see a really beautiful opportunity to help congregations of multiple faiths work together, united in their commitment to welcoming and caring for the neighbor. And so if that's something that you're interested in doing, if you're interested as a member of a synagogue who'd like to be connected to a member of a church, I'm going to drop my email in the link and I want to encourage you to reach out to me. And that's something that we're we're, we're, we're trying. We're, we're going to try that. But here's my email address. And uh, I'm going to bring it back to Lino now. Yeah, I just uh, thank you, Saj. I was going to mention that uh, exact point that uh, we've done some some projects when uh, with different faith groups. And that, that's been really, really great. We did one in Acton with an Afghan family, which was really, really game changing for our organization, having a Christian organization, Jewish organization really working together in the inter It was just I mean, it just just had so many dimensions. And I would say also our immediate needs. We have three refugee families coming in the next three months. And uh, so the, those participants here, uh, if uh, you uh, want to jump into some action, we would very much uh, love for you to be part of it. So thank you. Thank you, Lino. And uh, to, to this question about teens, just... Listen, we're already over time. If you gotta jump, then jump. But I want to answer this question. Um, we know if this is something that 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 teen groups could be of service to JFS Metro West. I'd love for you to speak on that. And if not, that's totally fine. Um, I, I would just generally encourage folks to, um, if you're working with teens, try and figure out what is helpful to the organizations. And if teens can check that box, wonderful. You know, what were you going to say? Yeah, no, we work with teens in all areas. You know, some do it because they, their schools require participation and then trying to figure out where do I make the most impact. So, yeah, we here at Metro West, we love teens. And uh, if we can't uh, engage them, we work with all, our other partners. But the teens are a future of our community. So if they want to participate, we have to figure out ways to make sure that they're able to, to do so. Fantastic. Any last words before we close out? All right. I'm going to uh, uh, wade into new and uh, slightly uncomfortable territory uh, with the encouragement of Reverend Kelly and Reverend Laura. I'm going to close this out in prayer, which is which is not something that I usually do. And uh, but Sasha, you might say that you are the spouse of a rabbi, so. <laughs> that's true i'm clergy adjacent but i'm yes. not clergy <laughs> yes thanks lino appreciate that um yeah. so actually what, what i would love to do is close this out in prayer that is collaborative and uh, uh jessica lino casey reverend laura and reverend kelly i'd love for you to come off of mute and uh and and in the time that feels right to you i want you to share a word of gratitude so i'm, I'm gonna just bring us together and say thank you i'm gonna say thank you for this time that we have to come together, to learn and to act. Thank you for allowing us the gift of listening, of being moved and moving with our prayers, with our hands, with our feet. Friends, please take this moment, drop a word of thanks with your words. One thing that you're thankful for today as we've gathered together 
and learned about how we can support our neighbors. I'm thankful for Reverend Laura. I'm thankful for Casey. Thankful for Lino. Thankful for Jessica. Thankful for Kelly for our time together. What are you thankful for, friends? I'm thankful for our community. Uh, together, we can really move the needle in a positive direction. And uh, the history books are written. I'd love to see that our bossy New Hampshire, New England community really set the tone, set the pace to welcome the stranger in our community. Thank you, Lino. I'm thankful for families that are brave enough um, to travel from home. Amen. Thank you, Laura. I'm thankful for everyone who hopped on this call today to to just consider this opportunity and um, really love our neighbors. I'm thankful. I'm thankful too for the um the way that this type of work and the people on this call and within our community um it just expands our hearts uh in such a way it just grows us into um into better people you know i'm <clears throat> thankful for that i'm thankful for this country and for the administration who is welcoming strangers into it and for the opportunities that are here and even when we think it's to live here it's so much easier to live here than in so many places that of course hard to Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Casey. Friends, thank you for blessing us all with your time and wisdom and for gathering, uh, for inspiring and encouraging our communities to pray with our hearts, with our words, and also with our feet as we move in action to help our neighbors in need. Uh, we stand here in support and as friends as we do this work together, and we look forward to building community, welcoming the stranger, and creating a stronger, safer, more equitable, healthier commonwealth for us all. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Sasha. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>